इस पे बोलना अपनी ये मौका है गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन यू हैड लेक्चर ऑन इंट्रोडक्शन टू मॉलिकुलर मैथड्स आई विल ट्राई टू ब्रिंग इन दी रेलिवेंस ऑफ दीज मॉलिकुलर मैथड्स टू डायग्नोसिस ऑफ इन्फेक्शस डिजीजेस सो माई इनिशियल फ्यू स्लाइड आर वेरी इंट्रोडक्टरी बट आई वॉन्ट टू रन थ्रू अ फ्यू पॉइंट्स फॉर प्रेपिंग यू फॉर द न्यूअर मैथड्स एज वेल एज फॉर अलाउंग यू टू अंडरस्टैंड हाउ दीज biochemical reactions which uh, lead to the polymerase chain reaction can actually be put to good use for uh, practical purposes so uh, i'm sure uh, dr megha has covered all these that where all can we use we can use nucleic acid based as for non culturable agents we can use it for fastidious slow growing agents highly infectious agents that are dangerous to culture and we can also use uh, nucleic acid based test for in situ detection of infectious agents and for agents present in very low numbers for uh, organisms present in small volume specimens for example in trocular fluid so these are the practical uses where we can actually put them to use and we can use molecular methods to differentiate antigenically similar agents so we often use it for detecting specific genotypes or in fact <coughs> for uh, uh, practical uses like antiviral drug susceptibility testing and so on and so forth uh, so uh, for non viable organisms organisms which on treatment so once the treatment is initiated the organisms would die but sometimes that uh, diagnosis um, using the dna or the rna can help us in a certain clinical picture where the differential diagnosis uh is important so so much so for <coughs> intra <coughs> for the introductory part it can be used for molecular epidemiology to point source uh, uh, an outbreak to predict virulence of an organism confirm a culture so there are different types of methods she has covered that so either you could just use a probe and hybridize it to the nucleic acid present in a sample which can be uh, without an amplification second is of course amplification methods which will amplify the dna and the amplification methods could involve target amplification probe amplification and signal amplification i'm sure she's dealt with those and uh, or we can use a combination of all the above and um, advantages of course it improves sensitivity uh improve it has a very high specificity if the design of the the amplification method or the molecular method is good the specificity would be high and uh, it will offer speed so we don't waste a lot of time and in fact of late some newer methods are being designed based on uh, newer technology which will reduce the time taken by pcr also and that is why where i wanted to stress right now so uh, coming straight to the pcr reaction now if you would pay attention here so there are three steps of pcr first being denaturation of target because we want to separate the two strands so we use either temperature based or there are some newer methods now i want you to understand what is being done now is so if pcr involves two major drawbacks one that we need temperature variations so we need an instrument which will give us 95 degrees celsius Uh, for denaturation it will give us uh, you know a uh, temperature around 60 to 70 for annealing of primers and it gives us a temperature of 72 for extension of a new strand so the two issues that bothered with pcr was one high temperatures and uh, um, you know uh, 60 to 70 degrees are both required so for you need a special machine secondly these three steps would add to the time taken for the procedure to complete so the newer methods which involve isothermal amplification methods get rid of the um, very high temperatures and uh, they use uh, you know one particular ambient temperature or a temperature which is uh, not does not need to be increased or decreased so that that's why they call the isothermal amplification reactions so uh, of course um, uh, dr megha has detailed uh, all this that how uh, the target is first denatured the primers would anneal and then there'll be extension and um, this is a picture of how a pcr uh, would go on and this is the basics which she would have dealt with 
So, um, before I move on to the isothermal methods, thermostable polymerases have been <coughs> isolated from different sources and there are various numbers of these. Now, TAC polymerases have been used for PCR, but of late newer enzymes are being discovered which can um, offer in addition to polymerase activity, they can offer strand displacement, for example, BST polymerase. In addition to um, the function of the polymerase, it will also help in strand displacement. So, those, so improvisations with accumulation of knowledge will bring in newer techniques and that is why I wanted to, um, you know, uh, for you all to understand. Now, basic reactions, uh, basic components of a reaction remain the same. So, we need a primer so that the, the initiation of an amplification reaction can happen. We need DNTP so that the building blocks of the uh, nucleic acid chain are there. We need uh, an ambient uh, atmosphere with adequate or the right amount of, um, you know, ions because it is an enzymatic reaction, all of these are. So, we need the enzyme to be working in the best atmosphere with the best of uh, uh, pH and uh, ionic content. Of course, the polymerase and the small amount of template which we plan to amplify and increase the number so that it can be visualized and identified. So, I have talked about the PCR cycle temperatures and I will uh, like to move further. So, um, contamination in the case of PCR is very important. One has to be vigilant that we are not introducing any contamination into a reaction. By contamination, I do not mean dust, etc. I mean um, uh, extraneous sources of DNA. So, for example, you are uh, trying to sample one particular uh, patient's tissue and the environment <laughs> during sampling is not... Uh, sterile and enough precautions have not been taken or the, um, the collection instruments are not uh, taken care of or the collection vials are not sterile. So, the introduction of the DNA from the environment can happen from the point of collection to the point of testing in the laboratory. This is something which we all should be aware of and uh, we must try to <coughs> excuse me, lessen the introduction of extraneous nucleic acid as far as possible. So, these are a few agents which are used to ensure that the environment is, uh, uh, you know, uh, nucleic acid free and so on and so forth. We take care of contamination control by designing the, um, the area where we do the testing as well. So, you have a pre-PCR and a post-PCR. So, post-PCR is the area where an amplicon is handled. So, if the amplicon is handled, it could get airborne in droplets and could cause contamination of a new PCR reaction. So, hence we keep the amplicon area totally separate from the pre-PCR area and this is uh, done diligently because <laughs> you are aware <coughs> the limit of detection of PCR is, is very good and we can detect very few organisms in the range of 10 to 100 organisms per mil. So, if it is a virus, you can well, well imagine if you pick up 5 to 10 organisms present in 1 ml of sample, if such an amplicon from post-PCR region is introduced, you will get a false positive. So, these issues have to be carefully uh, taken care of. You need a blank reaction, you need a negative control for every test, you need a positive control for every test to you know whether your test is performing well. Now, this Dr. Mega has already lab, uh, discussed with you how we observe uh, PCR amplicons on a gel and uh, um, the, the <laughs> uses of uh, PCR and the different modifications of PCR. Again, she's, uh, detailed, uh, she's had a detailed discussion regarding those modifications which are being practically put to use and the maximum um, uh, uh, use we are nowadays putting uh, to is the quantitative real-time PCR. You have understood the principles of PCR and uh, so in uh, the um, real-time PCR we can also semi-quantitate or quantitate by using an uh, internal standard. Now um, I am rushing through these slides because this has been uh, discussed with you. But uh, it will be good to reiterate these points because they, they are very important for your application purpose. Now, this is uh, how a real-time PCR, we look for the cycle number where the, so we call the cycle threshold, where the amplification happens exponentially 
and crosses above the baseline that is the background uh, um, noise and we call this as the cycle threshold and this is the uh, log curve that we find on the screen of the um, uh, real time PCR machine and this number often is able to tell us the semi quantitatively. So, when we are actually semi quantitatively um, uh, assessing the uh, target num number of target molecules we first draw a curve using a standard. So, it is only in comparison with the standard we can actually semi quantitatively say these many number of organisms per ml. So, in this you can appreciate several different samples with different CT values. So, the, the colored graphs are for different samples here and this is uh, uh, you know this has been uh, uh, generating uh, uh, with the standard we generate a standard curve to understand the CT values of each uh, uh, sample with 10 to power 1 organism, 10 to power 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and so on. So, I hope uh, you are understanding the now cyber green chemistry is one where cyber green is a dye which would just intercalate between a you know in a double stranded DNA and will help us uh, help us find the presence of a uh, the double stranded DNA in an amplification reaction in a real time PCR. The other chemistries involve um, labeled probes which could be uh, cleavage based probes for example, the Tachman assay, fluorescent reporter either present at the 5 prime end and the quencher at 3 prime end. So, when these bind I think I have nice pictures then we have molecular beacons which are hairpin loop structure again working on the same principles that a quencher quenches the fluorescent reporter and the separation of the molecular beacon as it binds the target will enhance the fluorescence. Then we have fluorescence resonance energy transfer FRET probes. So, this is a classical example of a Tachman. So, as the uh, the extension of the um, this thing the uh, strand occurs the fluorescent uh, molecule and the quencher molecules are cleaved from each other and the fluorescence appears. The quencher is uh, far away from the fluorescent molecule and the fluorescence will appear in the molecular beacon the hairpin loop structure fluorescence uh, molecule and the quencher molecule are uh, held together by the molecular beacon uh, tail end and as the molecular beacon binds to the target molecule these two are separated hence the fluorescence appears the fluorescence resonance energy transfer transfers the fluorescence once the binding of the probe occurs. Now, um, so I will I think I will move on to because this has been already discussed and I was just uh, repeating it. Now, we have certain uh, machines which have been uh, designed using these principles. <clears throat> Two examples I have brought here Safed some smart cycler and Roche light cycler. The principle remains the basic principle remains the same they have both modifi modified it to their best use and uh, now we have several other commercial concerns which have used the principle of real time PCR and give us automated detection and uh, so these are a few I cycler light cycler ABI systems flow tracker by strategy in flow imager by molecular dynamics biorad. And so, several companies like I said I are putting real time PCR to use and um, you know in the current epidemic that we have the SARS-CoV-2 epidemic a lot of use of these uh, instruments has been found and in fact um, uh, uh, places which were not doing molecular diagnosis earlier are now enabled to do molecular diagnosis. That is why the understanding of molecular methods for you is very important. Now, coming on to a few isothermal reactions of course, uh, so all these are target amplification methods whether it is PCR <coughs> or it is NASBA which is a isothermal isothermal amplification where we the, the NASBA stands for nucleic acid sequence based amplification I will try to touch upon it later. We have transcription mediated amplification strand displacement amplification. So, I talked about strand displacement uh, polymerases like BSC polymerase. And the, um, so, all these three NASBA TMA and SDA are isothermal amplification reactions and um, so, the transcription amplification methods uh, both the NASBA and TMA are isothermal RNA amplifications modeled after 
retro viral amplification uh, replication so what they they got the ideas when they you know it's similar to how a retrovirus would replicate so the rna target is basically first reverse transcribed into a cdna followed by rna synthesis using rna polymerase so amplification involves synthesis of cdna from an rna target with a primer which contains t7 rna polymerase promoter sequence hence the t7 rna polymerase can bind to the uh, RNA strand. So, if you would appreciate here, there is an RNA here and the T7 RNA um, promoter will bind here and the reverse transcription will happen. A cDNA strand will be formed which will <coughs> then be amplified using a DNA polymerase which will again reverse transcript, uh, reverse, transcript uh, reverse transcription will be done and uh, with the help of T7 polymerase. Uh, RNA's H will again um, uh, do reverse transcription and this cycle goes on. So, um, so much so far transcription based amplification in strand displacement ampli amplification or the STA, the uh, strand displacement um, uh, property of the uh, polymerase is used and in addition there is a restriction enzyme site introduced with the primer. So, there is a bumper primer which binds and displaces the strand generated by restriction engineered primer. The restriction enzyme then goes on to nick and further allows another primer to cause extension. Of course, this is in a big hurry I am trying to bring these to you. This was just to give you an idea that here if you notice the bumper primer is displacing the first strand along with the role of uh, BST polymerase and there is amplification and there is an introduction of an uh, nicking enzyme site in the bumper primer if you would appreciate the red region here which will enable a nicking and hence again uh, uh, you know the separation of the two strands which allows several single strands to be available. So, in addition so in place of denaturation using high temperature we are using strand displacement and a nicking enzyme. Now, this method has also been put to use by a new, um, uh, new machine which is given the name ID now by Abbott and we call the amplification near nick, uh, nicking endonuclease amplification reaction. I will come to that in a little while. Now, another isothermal amplification reaction is loop mediated isothermal amplification where it uses 4 to 6 different primers. Um, which recognize 6 to 8 distinct regions of the target DNA. A strand displacing DNA polymerase initiates the synthesis and two of the primers form loop structures. I wonder if you can see my, um, uh, since there is no pointer here, I am using the mouse. So, the uh, loops are formed here and there is exponential amplification which can be seen by the naked eye. I think I have a picture a little later. Now, I will come back to these methods, the isothermal amplification methods of target amplification, briefly to talk about probe amplification methods and signal amplification methods. Now, in the uh, <coughs> ligase chain reaction is again isothermal, but we amplify the probe instead of the uh, target here. So, the probes are in surplus in the um, uh, reaction and the probes will go and bind to the target sites and will get bound uh, to a double stranded DNA and will be picked up by the reaction. So, classically these will be annealed, the probes will be annealed, they will be ligated using a ligase chain, additional cycle is, cycles of denaturation, annealing and ligation goes on to generate the outcome. So, um, what we can utilize it uh, is to you to uh, amplify a mutant. So, we design mutant specific oligoprimers. So, the mutant specific primers will not bind to the wild type sequence, but will bind to the mutant sequence and we do not get any amplification in the case of wild type. Wild type is the non-mutated uh, type, hence it is called the wild type. The mutant sequence will amplify. This is just one example, but frankly PCR, uh, so LCR was also designed in the year uh, in the 90s, 1990s, but it has not really uh, picked up as much as PCR has picked up. Now, branch DNA is a, uh, uh, is a method where we uh, use uh, branch DNA amplifier probes and uh, we do not use enzymatic amplification, but we use amplifier probes 
and like I said um, amongst the, um, uh, the different amplification methods in addition to target amplification, probe amplification and signal amplification. So, branch DNA and hybrid capture are basically where the signal is amplified to make the target detectable to the system to the machine. So, uh, uh, you know uh, you will probably understand once we so if you uh, would appreciate the target here we bind a cap we bind a probe to the target here and <clears throat> then we hybridize a branch DNA probe to the capture probe to which a branch DNA amplifier is bound which is purple in color here and then we add a detection um, uh, enzyme with a detection molecule which can be a colorimetric reaction just like an ELISA or we can use uh, other methods like fluorescence or chemiluminescence. This is uh, another nice picture. So on a surface of a micro well if we have introduced a patient sample which has the target RNA we use target probes first then we add, uh, to that we hybridize the preamplifier then <coughs> hybridize BDNA uh, um, uh, so then we add the uh, amplifiers here as you can appreciate multiple um, it has multiple ports for the enzyme reaction to happen and then we add the substrate which can measure light in luminescence or fluorescence or color like I said earlier. Now this is another uh, signal amplification hybrid capture assay where we use a solution where the antibodies can be captured and chemiluminescence detection of hybrid molecules. So uh, we can have DNA RNA probes which are captured by DNA RNA antibodies. Again um, so uh, I tried to bring in pictures wherever I could gather them. So uh, first we release the nucleic acids now this is something that I have, we haven't really talked about. So nucleic acid extraction per se is a technique which has to be done very carefully and there are several methods available. So we have um, but by now we have automated uh, extraction systems as well which use chemical methods to actually uh, break open the bacteria or the virus by break open I mean in the case of bacterium you have to get rid of the cell wall, extract the nucleic acid in viruses again we release the nucleic acid and then we hybridize an RNA probe with the target DNA. So we have the uh, RNA DNA hybrids which can then be captured and then be detected with the help of again uh, you know antibody with the help of enzyme based um, one of the uh, either colorimetric fluorescent or luminescent. So uh, this is a summary of the previous few slides before I move on to application of these methods. Um, I think you more or less got it all by now since this was a repetition. Now what where all do we apply it? So for a better understanding I have brought in uh, a few slides where we are actually putting molecular biology to practical use. Um, initially I have a few slides how for diagnosis of TB we are putting these to use um, and uh, we will try to run through a, a few slides for uh, the sake of clarity and for the sake of you know um, application wise um, uh, understanding of the molecular methods usage in the field. Now um, so if we want to uh, do drug susceptibility testing on mycobacterium tuberculosis for example so um, you must be aware that in the case of M tuberculosis resistance to different drugs is um, due to mutations in specific genes for example in rifampicin in the case of rifampicin which is the mainstay of the first line treat, uh, treatment for TB resistance is uh, due to mutations occurring in the RPOB region RNA polymerase uh, the beta uh, fragment mutations in this region account for almost 96 percent of rifampicin mutations and as you are all aware rifampicin being the mainstay of first line treatment resistance to rifampicin leads to uh, what we call as MDR basically MDR TB is resistance to both rifampicin INH simultaneously and in the case of rifampicin mono resistance almost 96 percent of cases INH resistance coexists. It is only in less than 3 to 4 percent that resistance to rifampicin happens alone. Now coming back to the mutations which 
lead to resistance to rifampicin several methods have been put to use and now are being used at the ground in a big way so so much so that at the periphery at the district level laboratory we are able to use these molecular methods hence the application of these methods becomes very clear this picture actually summarizes this table summarizes the genes involved in resistance to these particular drugs for example inh we have incriminated cat g and inh a there are a few other genes ahpc uh, a few others which are less frequently involved but all these genes can only explain 80% of resistance in the case of inh in the case of rifampicin uh, more than 95% of uh, resistance mutations occur in the rpob in pyrazinamide again uh, uh, you know different reports have reported 72 to 97% mutations in the re in the gene pnca ethambutrol and embb streptomycin in these three genes amikacin and rrs ethionamide in uh, these two genes quinolones gyr a and gyr b and pass in inha and <laughs> thya gene the message being that the molecular methods can actually help us within very little time to uh, detect resistance to different drugs hence we can design the regimen uh, we call it tailor making the regimen uh, to the patient's needs and we can get good outcome so uh, so which are the commercial tests which are available for detection of mdr tb one is the um, genotype mtb dr plus which is uh, using a dna extraction followed by a pcr followed by hybridization on a nitrocellulose membrane if you can appreciate these bands here i'll try to explain how these bands are appearing and there are other methods uh, which is uh, now gene expert uh, has taken um, uh, has been uh, widely used we use uh, the cartridge called the expert <laughs> mtb rif which detects only resistance to rifampicin the new cartridge uh, is is uh, uh, being uh, now commercialized which detects resistance to in addition to first line drugs the second line drugs as well so that is called the xdr cartridge in the case of line probe assay the, which is uh, produced by um, uh, which is given uh, uh, you know commercially available as enolipa we can detect resistance to both inh and rifampicin and to quinolones and second line injectables hence it can tell us both first line resistance and second line resistance so um, again uh, line probe assay uh, has the same so first you extract the dna you amplify the dna using the pcr then we do the hybridization on a strip and then we result we interpret the results so what happens here is this is a reverse hybridization method so <laughs> we hybridize probes to the mutant area to the mutation so we are hybridizing the mutant probes on the nitrocellulose membrane we are not so we are immobilizing i'm sorry we are immobilizing mutant probes onto the cell the uh, nitrocellulose membrane and after we have done the amplification from the patient sample we reverse hybridize the pcr amplicon onto the nitrocellulose membranes if there is a mutation present there will be hybridization in the mutant probe in addition to the mutant probes we also have wild type probes so the non mutated <laughs> sample the sample containing um a uh, microorganism which has no mutations will hybridize to the uh, wild type probes while the, the mutated or the resistant organism will bind to the mutant probes the presence of different mutations have also been associated with high level and low level resistance especially in the case of inh so we can also decide based on these tests whether we can use high dose um, uh, inh for therapy in these patients especially in uh, you know so high dose inh is part of the mdr regimen now <coughs> this this is a slide which is summing up the performance of different line probe assays commercially available and uh, so uh, this is uh, semi automated where we have a uh, hybridization chamber and we have um, uh, this is not completely automated this method is completely automated and puts to use so this is only detecting rifampicin resistance and gives us a result as uh, mtb detected and rif resistance detected or not detected based on the binding of probes in a real time pcr so the picture so this is the basic principle this is a molecular beacon where the fluorescent fluorophore and the quencher are in approximation to each other as long as the molecular beacon does not bind to the so this strand the red strand is the 
uh, the parent or the, the organism strand and once the amplification occurs during real time PCR the probe complementary to the wild type sequence will bind to the target sequence. Now if the wild type sequence is mutated the probe fails to bind. So once the probe fails to bind the curve of for that particular probe is delayed. Now wha the, so what we try to see is the difference in the uh, CT values of these probes which bind and with the looking at the difference uh, in these probes we can actually say that a mutation is present in the region of one particular probe. So five probes the, depending on their binding or the absence of their binding we can say that this particular did not this particular probe did not bind hence there is a mutation in this region so the machine reads it as rifampicin resistance. Now uh, this is a slide uh, just I wanted to bring in that um, exp um, a gene expert has been recommended by WHO for extra pulmonary samples as well and different extra pulmonary samples have different issues. So this is something to be kept in mind that certain samples can have inhibitors of PCR and our extraction methods have to be so well designed that we get rid of these inhibitors but that is not always possible. So inhibition can affect our PCR and that is why certain extra pulmonary samples may not be amplified using these molecular methods. So WHO uh, recommends but also gives these riders that uh, these samples may not be most efficiently uh, amplified. So always phenotypic backup of phenotypic drug resistance detection is always kept. Nevertheless, the speed by which we can use these molecular methods and uh, this can help us in decision making as far as drug resistance is, uh, uh, you know, treatment is concerned or uh, decision to give which drugs is concerned. Even if we are not able to detect in a few samples, we should be aware that these uh, caveats are present and we should always keep uh, looking for more evidence. Now, um, so this is a comparison between uh, these two methods, the line probe assay and uh, uh, gene expert. I think I should move on. Now, this is where the future uh, will take us that we have lab on chip. And I have some more slides before I actually talk about lab on chip. Now all these uh, look very interesting and so this is just for you to know how molecular methods have been put to very good use and we are learning more every day, refining our techniques. <coughs> so here I bring in uh, the, um, the application to the diagnosis of COVID-19. Now this is a, a table here which will tell you so if we are wanting to diagnose say the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the, we would uh, extract the RNA, we could amplify it using PCR amplification where we use a real time PCR followed by next generation sequencing or we could use isothermal amplification methods like I talked about LAMP. There are certain newer methods like the RPA, more methods where CRISPR along with the CAS enzymes, CRISPR-CAS enzymes have been put to use. One such method is Sherlock, I will come to it briefly. So like I said, one option is to amplify the <laughs> nucleic acid. Of course, there are other options where we can detect the antigen present on the uh, top of the virus, um, uh, where we use uh, antigen detection methods. Um, we can also look for antibodies, but right now my purpose is to concentrate on the nucleic acid amplification by molecular method. So to the right you will see that the limits of detection of different methods vary. So the RT, uh, the reverse transcription, so this being an RNA we will have to first perform the reverse transcription reaction followed by amplification. So reverse transcription quantitative PCR uh, which is uh, considered the gold standard and this would detect uh, the analytical sensitivity is uh, about 140 copies per ml, so 0.14 copies micro, per microliter. There is something called as droplet digital PCR which is a very refined form of PCR which amplifies, so which breaks the sample uh, or the RNA into multiple tiny droplets with the help of emulsification with uh, oil and the amplification happens inside these tiny, very tiny droplets. 
So, the sensitivity of this particular uh, the, uh, droplet digital PCR is very very high. This has in fact the highest reported sensitivity. It will detect 0 0.02 copies per microliter or 20 copies per ml. If we use reverse transcription lamp, the reported sensitivity has been uh, 480 copies per ml. If we use reverse transcription RPA, I have a nice picture a little later. Uh, you will understand how we put the RPA to use. This is at par with the PCR. Uh, RT near almost at par with the, <laughs> with the gold standard PCR. Now detector and stop. Stop used Sherlock method and detector again used a CRISPR Cas enzyme. Um, so all these newer methods RT RPA, RT near, detector and stop have been successful in reducing the time used for getting the results. So this is in fact faster than the PCR which may be required in today's times when we want to triage a COVID-19 patient that walks into our OPD or into our emergency. We would like to triage that patient for uh, the best of his care as well as for protecting the healthcare worker. So these methods have actually been put to use and we have certain wonderful techniques which are now available. Of course, um, you know, um, for example, uh, in the case of stop, the sensitivity was not at par with the RTP, both detector and stop sensitivity was much less, the analytical sensitivity was less than the PCR, but they are trying to improvise. Um, also what is important for you to understand that the gene sequence that is being used can help us improvise the analytical accuracy as well as the design of the primer and the technique used. Uh, like I have said, the, whether you are using a lamp or a digital PCR, your <coughs> detection limits will differ. Now, <coughs> this is a picture which tells you how we first isolate the RNA. We do <coughs> reverse transcription followed by PCR. Now, these are certain methods which are available using the real-time RT-PCR in a cartridge-based or a chip-based format which is being used uh, throughout the country in addition to the RT-PCR. Now, uh, the TrueNAT, which is an Indian indigenous and gene expert, which is uh, also used in the case of both these methods are also available for TB diagnosis and several other pathogen diagnosis are basically um, uh, in, a, uh, in a cartridge, they, the, all the reagents are sealed, both the extraction and amplification go on inside the same cartridge. In TrueNAT, it is a two step, first we do the RNA extraction followed by PCR just like the RT-PCR which is uh, either done on an open or a closed platform and uh, the detection limits are all at par usually in the range of 100 to 200 copies 400 maximum per ml. The time of course can vary depending on the design of the test. Now in the case of COVID-19 we recommend at least a BSL-2 laboratory because we are handling the nucleic acid. Um, here I wanted to bring in the other methods, the LAMP, the RPA, NEAR and CRISPR-Cas and their uh, limits of detection which I have already covered. Here again we will <coughs> first do extraction of the RNA followed by amplification followed by detection. Now this is a picture of LAMP which I have already mentioned that we use 6 primers which um, will give us the result if you could appreciate here we will be able to uh, appreciate the result with the naked eye. <coughs> this is a picture of um, a, a recombinase based uh, uh, amplification where a recombinase um, uh, 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 for is basically forms a nucleoprotein filament along with the primers and uh, we have certain loading factors. <coughs> this enables us to displace the strand and amplify again this just goes on exponentially and the result can be appreciated with the naked eye. So we have RNA, we have the enzymes including recombinase and we have the probes and this amplification goes on exponentially. In the case of um, near what I mentioned earlier, so we have uh, a stabilizing spacer which will uh, bind to the target molecule. We have a nicking restriction site in the primer and we have the target binding site. Now once the primer binds to the target here, we have all these three sites, the stabilizing site, the target binding site and we have a site where the nicking enzyme can actually nick the strand. 
enabling the strand separation enzymatically instead of denaturing required with the help of heat. So this enables the uh, exercise of amplification go on faster than the PCR. So you can imagine instead of you know a PCR which could take about one and a half to two to three hours this would complete the whole step within 15 to 30 minutes. So this is what Abbott has come up with this is the ID now. So if you can so again this is for COVID um, a patient swab which goes into the sample receiver which goes into a transfer cartridge into a test space and the result is out within 15 minutes 15 to 30 minutes. So this is as good as the antigen test, I mean as far as the time is concerned with a better limit of detection. Antigen test also we are supposed to read between 15 to 30 minutes, 30 minutes before we call it negative but there there is no amplification of the nucleic acid happening hence the limit of detection of this method is much better. But like I said the sensitivity analytical sensory is not yet at par with the, um, uh, uh, the PCR, the RT-PCR. A comparison of gene expert and Abbott ID was done. Uh, in one of the publications available uh, in um, JCM and uh, Abbott ID sensory was much lower. Now this is using where so instead of nicking using a um, nicking endonuclease we use the CRISPR Cas enzyme. So we first do an amplification so we use sample is collected RNA is extracted we amplify using one of the isothermal methods so that we don't have to use a PCR machine for uh, varying the temperature either we use RT lamp or we use RT RPA followed by detection with the help of CRISPR Cas where <coughs> the CRISPR Cas will also uh, bind a, a, a target pro, a, a fluorescent probe which can then be detected by lateral flow on a membrane. Now this to the right is what we are hoping where we are hoping to reach we can put you know different newer technology to diagnose um, uh, uh, infectious diseases even at bedside so much so that we hope to be able to put it to use that uh, you know the a smart toilet could actually tell the patient himself on his mobile that he has a viral RNA. This would be of course uh, uh, the future if we continue to improvise our methods. So we could have biosensors like we have here and um, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so this is an Indian uh, adaptation of the uh, Sherlock, uh, the Faluda uh, which is basically using the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 enzyme and um, the full name stands for uh, um, uh, FN-Cas9 Editor Limited Uniform Detection Assay. Both Sherlock and Faluda are um, uh, the names given um, uh, you know for the uh, the fictional investigators so Faluda was uh, um, uh, an Indian uh, um, uh, fictional character as was Sherlock uh, in the UK. So we extract the RNA we do an RT-PCR so reverse transcription followed by a PCR so 15 minutes for extraction 44 minutes for RT-PCR and then we incubate with the Cas9 enzyme which <coughs> will bind with the help of guide RNA and um, so there is a guide RNA and the ribonuclear protein complex which will then uh, uh, cut the amplicon and will so there will be a detection with the help of a probe on the uh, uh, this this is a picture of a true net extraction system this is how we do PCR so first we extract the RNA we add it on a chip here the chip goes into the system and amplifies and gives us curves like this we can have so the, the, the different colors <coughs> for different genes. So we must ensure that in all these samples now what is important is we must ensure that there is adequate amount of host um, tissue present. So because we are looking for a virus which may be which would be present inside the host cell. So we have um, a control which is RNASP which is a host control. <coughs> And uh, 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 so uh, here we have the uh, DNA uh, of uh, the RNA. Uh, so the, this particular uh, curve, the purple curve, is for um, the E gene uh, for COVID-19 diagnosis, and the red for the control. So only if the host RNA is being amplified do we say that yes, E gene is positive or negative. I mean thereby before calling a sample negative we must ensure adequate amount of host tissues present. 
Now this is a picture of how gene expert detects uh, SARS-CoV-2. This is the gene expert system if you would appreciate at the bottom with four modules or two modules and a laptop which shows us this particular graph and you can appreciate on the top it gives us the CT values. So the E gene CT value here is 36.5 and the NT gene and N2 gene which is specific to SARS-CoV-2 E gene is shared between the different uh, um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus that uh, includes SARS which uh, you are aware the epidemic happened in 2003, uh, bad SARS and SARS-CoV-2. So the N2 gene being specific tells us that this is SARS-CoV-2 we are detecting. I wanted to bring in these pictures for you to have a practical experience that we can uh, we are actually putting to how we are actually putting it to use. So if we detect only the E gene we call the sample as presumptive positive for COVID-19 uh, in the absence of NTU N2 gene amplification. Um, so this is how uh, uh, N2 gene is detected here if you can appreciate this curve. The, the, this curve is sample processing control again a control which is inherent. Now uh, that uh, is the end of the talk for today. And uh, 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 I would appreciate if uh, there are any doubts, if some questions are shared with us. Thank you. So uh, the questions can be sent on our email and uh, we would be happy to answer those.